Thor Peterson is a Danish traveler who has just completed 10 years of visiting all 203 countries in the world without going on a plane. Welcome to Team Buzz Radio, Thor. Thank you very, very much. It's a pleasure to be with you guys. Okay, I'm here with our celebrity gossip expert, in okay. Nini. Um, my first question is, why? <laughs> yeah, and my response would be, why not? There you go, I like that. Uh, why not? Wow. Okay, where did you get the idea from? I got it from my father, uh, but I don't think he knew that he passed the idea on to me. He sent me an email. He sent me so many emails over the years with uh, different articles and links. And I, I followed this one and I was reading about people who had gone to every country in the world. And I found that it was just a few hundred people who had managed to do so. And no one had managed to do it completely without flying. And that idea just stuck with me. So wow. I started uh, playing with the idea and bought a map and looked at the budget and the, a time estimate. And uh, yeah, eventually I was set and good to go. How long did it take you to plan the trip? Uh, it, you know, I would say about 10 months, but it wasn't structured planning all 10 months. The first four, five months maybe would have just been me toying around with the idea. And then once I actually set my mind to it, then I had to find out where was the finances going to be coming from and what would the route be and uh, what would I pack and what would the values be and, and not a project name and my clothing and the equipment and all this stuff. Incredible. Wow. Incredible. What was your favorite country? Uh, well, you, could, you can't really have a favorite country when you've been to so many countries. Um, I, I'd say it's a little bit like music. So in this case, it was 203 countries. Let's say you have a playlist with 203 songs. Which one would you pick as your favorite? And it would probably depend a little bit on if you're trying to go to sleep or if you're right. out to exercise <laughs> or, or if there's a song you listen to 100 times in a row, then you want to break from that and so on. So it's not well, easy to pick from. Incredible. What was the shortest amount of time you spent in one country? That was 24 hours and 17 minutes. Wow, down to the minute. Which country was this? That was the Vatican. Wow. wow. Ah, the Vatican, yeah. Yeah, so actually, um, the Vatican doesn't allow overnight visitors, uh, not tourists, certainly. Wow. So you'd have to be a resident in order to get uh, a bed and a room to sleep in. They chase everybody out of the Vatican at uh, around 10 or 11 in the evening and say, oh thank you, God, we'll that's crazy. Again tomorrow. So you need to find somewhere to hide if you want to do it for 24 hours. And uh, I did that, people do that. Um, but there's like this, this rim around the edge of the, uh, the Vatican where the fence doesn't go all the way to the edge of the Vatican, but the ones that guard the Vatican, they they do not care about what goes on on the other side of the fence. It's just an additional couple of meters on the other side of the fence. So you have the, this little rim where you can stay <laughs> within the Vatican, but the guards don't care. And homeless people have worked this out. So they stay there during the night and they uh, are not harassed by police in Rome, but they're also not harassed by anyone from the Vatican. So it's a little safe zone. Oh, wow. Very cool. Well, I must say, why we get the list of the countries that we have listeners in at the end of every month. And once we had a listener from the Vatican. So I you always uh, yeah, I always joke, ah, the Pope is listening to Team Buzz Radio. <laughs> <laughs> well, shout out to the Pope in uh, the Vatican. Please uh, do invite me back. I would like to sleep in a bed for once. <laughs> um how was this 10-year trip funded? Um, well, the short answer to that is that a large part of it was uh, funded by a corporation. So it was corporate funding. And a big part of it as well was my own funding, so self-financed. And then a, a third of it, also a lot of money came from donations. So... Originally, I set out with a partner, so that was Ross Energy, and we thought it would all take four years or less, and they were in it for that. 
Um, but then eventually, in I think in 2015 or so, oil prices were low and this hurt the company. So they had to withdraw their financial sponsorship. And then everything else just kind of came along. And then eventually Ross Energy came back at a later point because they are in it for the long run. And uh, it was a mix of like, yeah, corporate, myself, and uh, donations. Yeah, you had a donation page, Once Upon a Saga. How did you get the name Once Upon a Saga? Yeah, um, well, I brought some friends on board in the early days before I left home. So there were four of us all together, and I call us the project group. And we were trying to work out with a name, and we had all sorts of ideas. We're like, Dane, Dane, but different was one of them. Oh, that's and cool. We, we, we tried different, different things. We couldn't really settle on anything. And then eventually I came up with Once Upon a based on a fairy tale. So yeah. Denmark, for me at least, is a fairy tale kind of country. It's a, it's a monarchy, a kingdom, princess and princesses. Hans Christian Andersen is from Denmark, wrote The Little Mermaid and many other stories. So once upon a, and we could all agree on that, but then the question was, once upon a what? <laughs> and uh, we had uh, all sorts of different suggestions. And then eventually I came up with the uh, saga based on uh, the Viking heritage of the Nordic country. So the Vikings would go out and explore the world and come back. And the most prominent ones would have their stories written down. And that would be called a saga. So by saying once upon a, then that's a direct uh, reference to my country, Denmark, and saga to the Nordic countries. And so the entire project name sort of points towards where I come from. Now, COVID struck in the middle and you were stuck in Hong Kong for two years. How was that? <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, I didn't know it was going to be two years. <laughs> yeah. um, in, in the very early days, I was networking. I thought it was just a question about re meeting the, the right people, making the right connections. And if I could find the right person that could open the door for me, then I would be on my way. And then eventually it was announced it was a global pandemic. So I was in I was in I was in Hong Kong before it was announced a global pandemic. It was a breakout in, in uh, Wuhan, China. And then as a part of greater China, uh, I, you know, that, that really stumbled everything on my behalf. Over time, um, media so started to pay interest to my situation and I was doing lots and lots of interviews. And with all of that attention, I got attention from companies and from Hong Kong Tourism Board and many others and started collaborating with them. And then uh, after 11 months, immigration pushed me to get a job. They said, we cannot keep extending your visa. You cannot continue to be a visitor. So at that point, I knew a lot of people in Hong Kong. I've been networking like crazy for almost a year. So I was set up with a job at the, the port where I was servicing container ships that came in because the seafarers couldn't leave the ships mm -hmm. and they were isolated on board the ships. So they needed all sorts of stuff, which I could go and buy in, in Hong Kong. Then I spent an awful lot of time um, hiking and trail running and enjoying the beautiful nature of Hong Kong. Many don't know it, but Hong Kong is 75% nature and it's only 25% wow. urban setting. And you have the different neighborhoods, you have the food and... Yeah, it was simultaneously maybe the worst and the best time of my life. The worst because I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know how long I would have to hold on. It was a question about aborting the project and or continuing and sticking with it. But then it was just such a wonderful place to be. And I met the most incredible people and had a really good time with them as well. Was that the first time or at all ever on your trip where you thought, OK, I've had enough. The, we're done. Jump ship kind of thing. <laughs> No, no, not at all. The, I, I set out in 2013, and after a couple of years, I was done. And, I mean, two two years was well enough. After enough time living out of a bag and uh, being on the road, buses, trains, uh, doing all the paperwork, visas, checkpoints, everything you need to push on, it really started to feel like a job. So it went from being 99% adventure and 1% work to being 99% wow. work and 1% adventure uh, within the first two years. And then I just continued to push on in the hopes that it would get easier or get better. And sometimes it would get easier and better. And sometimes it would get hard again or almost impossible. So at the point when I was six, seven, seven years in, and thinking, okay, this is almost over. I'm down to the last few countries and the pandemic broke out. Wow. 
That really wasn't helpful. Uh, yeah. How did you deal with the like if you had a medical issue, especially during the pandemic? If if you happen to get COVID, how did you uh, how did you address that? Well, I'm one of those who never got COVID. At least I never oh. tested positive for COVID. <laughs> and I have tested a lot. I've tested to get into foreign island nations, to get on board ships, to this and this and that. I think my nose is probably twice the size of what it was before. <laughs> But uh, no, uh, across the world, uh, there's always, there are hospitals and depending on which country you're in, it might be a good or not so good idea to go to the hospital. <laughs> um, there are clinics, there are private clinics. Um, I fell sick with malaria, with cerebral malaria when I was in Ghana in Western Africa. And I was taken to a, a clinic and they took really good care of me and I was sick for a few weeks, really, really sick. And then eventually I recovered and was able to move on again. I've been to the dentist in three countries around the world. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, uh, so I've been to the dentist in Lebanon and in Hong Kong and in Fiji as well. Wow. What was the country that was the most scariest for you to enter? Mm, it would have been one of two countries. And the reason why they would be so scary was because the security situation across the border was in both cases um, unsound. And I did not have enough time to prepare, meaning that I had I had something else I had to, I had, I had somewhere else I had to be within a few days. In one case, it was a ship that wasn't going to wait for me. So I needed to go inside this one country and come out and reach the ship. And I didn't have time to put up the necessary security precautions, have a contact and all this stuff. So the two countries I'm talking about, one was uh, South Sudan, um, which became a country in 2011. It's the world's newest country. And uh, it, they were just there. It's still not good in South Sudan, but it was absolutely horrible uh, back when I was crossing the border. And the other one was Yemen. And, and, and Yemen has been the subject of civil strife for quite some time and civil unrest. And, uh, you know, if you want if you want to support uh, the Red Cross and humanitarian work, uh, then those are two countries too. definitely. There are many places you can look at, but those they need some assistance. And was it difficult to get visas to get into some countries like Iran, North Korea? Mm, North Korea is surprisingly easy, um, although not right now, because it's the only country in the world that still has not opened up after the pandemic. But outside of the pandemic, you just go to a tour agency and you provide them with all the necessary documentation and then they will they will do all the paperwork for you and organize for you and you go to North Korea. Um, the hard countries would have been Equatorial Guinea, which is a small nation, only Spanish speaking country in all of Africa, in Central Africa. And it took me about three months to get the visa by going to different embassies and different consulates, crossing international borders and going through hundreds of checkpoints. <laughs> it was wow. a hard, rough visa to get, only to learn that they had closed their borders. Nobody in, nobody oh, out. Wow. So I had to wait another 27 days until I found a solution to cross the border. Saudi Arabia didn't have a tourist visa for 40 years. And I was at the end of the 40 years. So, I mean, I when I eventually went to Saudi Arabia, a couple of years later, I could read. Now they have a tourist visa. <laughs> but I, I really struggled to get in. It took me about seven months. Um, there are some of the island nations in the Pacific, certainly if you're not flying, like Nauru, which is both a difficult visa, but also a hard country to reach without flying. There's Tuvalu, which is easy in terms of bureaucracy, but hard in terms of uh, logistics, yeah. finding a vessel to take you. Wow. Wow. Did you ever think at one point that you would die on the trip? Yeah. Yeah. I was at uh, gunpoint, uh, but there were these three very drunken uniformed men uh, that were armed to their teeth and they were... They, the situation was out of control. It was a very, very hostile environment. And uh, I, I thought I had seconds left to live. I, I thought that was actually game over. It came over. It was in the middle of the night in the jungle in Central Africa. There was no one else there. And it was just absolutely uh, emotional and, and out of control. But I was able to get out of that. 
Um, three of the ships that I've traveled on board are confirmed to be at the bottom of the sea today. You have, uh, wow. you have vessels that are at the end of their life. And uh, it's not a question about are they going to sink? It's a question about when are they going to sink? Are they going oh to do... Oh, my goodness. Is it on the next run? Is it on the next 10 runs? Nobody knows. And they do no longer, they no longer have safety equipment. Um, the, the staff might not be properly trained to handle an emergency or the ship. The engines might not be serviced in the way they should be. And they're definitely completely overloaded with uh, both passengers and cargo. So they will just go to the bottom like an anchor if something happens. And uh, yeah, three of them are confirmed to be at the bottom of the sea. It's a little bit like Russian roulette with ships. Wow. wow. How often, if at all, did you meet up with your family and friends? <laughs> well, the one I met up with the most was my wonderful wife. Uh, she came out to see me 27 times across the world. <laughs> and wow. we estimate that an average visit would have been about two weeks meaning that we spent more than a year together throughout all of this, which is really, really good. Then my parents have been out separately um, to visit me several times. I have two younger siblings. They've both been out to visit me. I have friends that have been out to visit me. And then I met a lot of people along the way that became friends as I went along. Amazing. How, how did you deal with the loneliness? Yeah, well, so there are different types of loneliness, isn't there? Like the one type is when you're actually physically alone. There's no one around and you feel alone. And uh, the other one, I reckon, is when you feel misunderstood. So you might be together with people, but somehow you feel ostracized. You feel outside of the community. So you could be in a room full of people. You could be at a party or you could be in a classroom or so. And then somehow you still feel alone, even though you can reach out and touch someone else. And I think for the most part, I felt that kind of loneliness because more often than not, people were somewhere nearby in buses and trains and on the streets and so on. But a lot of the time people would look at me and think that I was a a tourist or that I was on a holiday or that I wouldn't <laughs> know what I had been through to get to where I was and for how long I had been traveling and the effort I put into it. So I felt very, very misunderstood. And how did I deal with that? You know, I think you, in, in my case, I probably just reached out to the bits and pieces of encouragement that I could get when someone sends me a, a nice message and says, it's amazing what you're doing or keep on, never give up. And it, it, it's really impactful. Then I take that little note and then I ignore everything else. And I go like, okay, somebody cares. Or when my wife uh, encourages me and says, you know, it's not important what the world thinks about you. It's important what I think about you. <laughs> so, so <laughs> right. I, I take that with me inside my heart. And uh, over the years, I've received quite a few encouraging messages. So, I mean, maybe it's about focusing on the, the positive and, and trying to ignore everything else. Amazing, amazing. What would you say the most beautiful country was? Oh, that, that, that's so, so hard to say. <laughs> Off the top of my head, some really, really beautiful countries would be Venezuela is gorgeous. Uh, Angola is gorgeous. But then there are two countries where I feel that they're they're both beautiful countries, but also there's something about the air that is almost more clear and, and doesn't matter which direction you want to take a photo, you get a perfect picture back. And that would be Greenland and New Zealand. And I wonder if it's got something to do with how far they are from the equator or something. But there are many, many beautiful. And then beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So it really right. depends on do you like the desert, do you like the jungle, do you like the city, do you want like mountains, do you want flat landscapes and so on. Where would you say the most interesting people were? Um, or maybe I, friendly. I maybe. Well, okay, most interesting, I'd say North Korea, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, I think they're they're misunderstood. You know, people, we we hear so much about North Korea and a lot of the things we hear about North Korea might not even, it's just speculation, it might not even be true. But we do tend to 
forget that they are humans, right? Like, people do fall in love in North Korea, not at gunpoint, but they do fall in love and they get married and people do like a good meal. And when it's cold, people are cold and they, they don't like it and they find discomfort in it. And when the sun is shining or if someone tells a joke or if they feel love and warmth and they're happy and like dancing and, you know, it's still a country with mountains and beaches and so on. So I'd say that from the perspective of having a very famous country such as North Korea that hardly anyone has been to or knows anyone who has been to, the people become a little bit mysterious and, and therefore maybe the most interesting people. And the most friendly that open arms welcomed you like immediately, where would you say that was? I mean, my, my mind goes straight to Uganda uh, because wow. I felt that Uganda was the kind of culture and I mean, it's a big country and, and the culture varies depending on where you go, but it almost felt like you you'd just have a stranger come up to you on the street and give you a hug. Uh, but then most of the Middle East has this uh, incredible level of uh, hospitality and uh, a country like Pakistan, for instance, um, is, is, is a country that has a saying, which is the guest is God. So oh, wow. not thereby meaning that the guest is actually God, but that the guest should never, you should never leave your guest wanting. Like the guest is not going to help with anything, carry anything, to just sit and enjoy and be fed and entertained. <laughs> so Speak there's a lot of hospitality around the world. Speaking of food, where would you say the best food was? <laughs> this is another one of those. You're picking from <laughs> 203 countries. Right. Everybody likes good food. Right, right. <laughs> Thing. you know like around the world there's there's not a country where they worship bad food <laughs> every country <laughs> has good food and they've had thousands and thousands of years to work out what kind of what grows in the ground and what kind of plants and what you can put together and how you can make it really tasty and nice but for me personally i would say italy um italy is a very large country it's not just pasta and pizza i mean fresh salads and fruit and it's a good go-to country because the variety is so so large that's awesome where would you say the best shopping was like clothes and just culturally like that you felt like i gotta buy everything i gotta get another suitcase or <laughs> I, I've, I've been living on a $20 per day budget for oh my time. goodness <laughs> so I mean that over the course of the years that turned my mind to a, a mindset of <laughs> do I need this or do I want this you know the difference between do I need it or do big I big want difference. it big difference and I, I haven't been on shopping sprees anywhere but but maybe Hong Kong I mean Hong Kong is is uh, a happening place you know and then there's a lot of good shopping opportunities in Hong Kong, especially electronics. And I did buy a lot of electronics while I was there. Very cool. Do you think that it takes an exceptional person to be able to do this, to travel, to get to every country, but just not to get there, but to go without a plane? Or do you think anyone who could accomplish this? I think that's a good question. Um, I think that you would need to look at who you are and then assess if you have what it takes to do it. And generally, I'd say that you need to have three different uh, qualities in order to accomplish it overall. One is you have to be stubborn, but, um, like the most stubborn person in your family, the most stubborn <laughs> at, school, at your workplace, that you have to be stubborn to a point where it's almost crazy. Because if you quit just once, then it's not going to happen. Then you need to be a social kind of creature. You can be introvert, but you have to be able to act extroverted because you need to go out and meet people. You will not be able to solve all of the complications along the road on your own. You will have to find the solutions through people. And then you'd also have to have those people either like you or like what you're doing, or else you're not going to get help from those people. So you need to have this social intelligence to accomplish it as well. So now you have you have to be stubborn and you have to have the social intelligence. And then I would say you have to be a problem solver. If you're the kind of person who sits down and says, I don't know, I can't, there's no way I can't do it. Yeah, so if you can't find your solution uh, for the problems that arise or the challenges that arise along the way, then it's also not going to happen. So these are three qualifications as, as a person. It's, it's stubbornness, it's, it's being someone who can connect with people and it's being someone who can solve problems. And if you remove any one of those three, then it's not going to happen. Then the question is, 
how high do you rate on these three? And I would say the higher, the better to accomplish it. So does that make you an exceptional human being having those qualifications? I don't know. Um, but maybe having them in a really high degree makes you exceptional. All right, you're back home now in uh, Denmark. Do you ever get bored and go, oh, I want to travel? Or are you planning another adventure? <laughs> One of the first things I did after coming back home was I went to Finland because my mother is from Finland and I wanted to see her. I hadn't seen her for six years. Wow. So that was, that was my first travel out of the country. Then I have traveled across uh, Denmark because there have been different engagements where I've been invited for this and that. I recently came back to Denmark from Portugal. I was there for a uh, travel fest where I was invited as a speaker. And uh, yeah, no, I've done almost 100 interviews since I came back home. Wow. Uh, my wife and I, we moved from one apartment to the other. So this, this one, there's nothing on the wall here. This is the <laughs> new apartment. We're putting together Ikea furniture from morning to evening. <laughs> uh, so bored? Not at all. I'm going on an expedition to Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, which is in uh, Azerbaijan. It's an enclave in Azerbaijan. It's been in the media a lot in, in recent days. Um, but it's disputed territory between Armenia and, and Azerbaijan. And I'm going there with neutral eyes just to, to see what I think about the place. I've been invited on an expedition there. So I'll be going with some really interesting people. Wow. That That's sounds amazing. fantastic. Thank you very much, Thor Peterson, for speaking to us at the Team Buzz Radio. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thanks for having me.